Hi, I'm Anne McGrath. I'm the literary editor for Monkfish Books, and I'm here with should be three of our authors. Right now, we only have two because Joey DeVito is having trouble getting in. Um, but uh, these uh, hopefully three authors are going to be in conversation around the theme of healing intergenerational trauma. And all three of them have written books that connect around that theme. Um, we're looking to highlight what we can learn from each book about healing trauma. And the authors will discuss the connections between their books. And if it seems um, appropriate and they're so moved, they will read excerpts from their books if it uh, uh, goes with the discussion. After 30 minutes, I will read any questions that you have in the chat. Otherwise, you'll be muted. So anything that you'd like to say or if you want to just say hello or where you're from and put it in the chat, that would be great. And at the end, we'll put author links and a link to our website and we would love you to sign up for our newsletters um so we'll get started i'll introduce the the two authors we have here now and i'll also introduce joey who isn't here and hopes that she she'll join us shortly uh rabbi tirza firestone is a Jungian psychotherapist a leader in international jewish renewal movement and the author of two books that we, many books, but two books that we've published um, with Roots in Heaven is, is uh, reprinted, uh, One Woman's Passionate Journey into the Heart of Her Faith and Wounds into Wisdom, which is a really for anyone who has suffered trauma, um, healing intergenerational Jewish, Jewish trauma. And the, the foreword is by Gabor Mate. Joey DeVidow, who isn't with us yet, but um, her novel, Anything But Yes, was just published by Monkfish. Uh, she lives in Italy right now. She's uh, on the West Coast, though. She's visiting California. She was the founder and editor of two award-winning magazines back when she was a journalist. And she also wrote a novel, The Unofficial Marriage. The moderator today is Anna Goodman Herrick, and her debut poetry book um, is out in June 4th of this year, and uh, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Anna is a poet, a filmmaker, a peacemaker, and an interdisciplinary artist who works at the intersection of spirituality, sacred word, and human rights. She's created work, she's created for uh, television and branded content for Sony, ABC Television, the Oprah Winfrey Network, and MTV. So the moderator today is going to be Anna, and I'm going to mute uh, to turn it over to her. And then I'll be back at the half hour point to read any questions that you have in the chat. If there aren't any questions, then I, I just won't even interrupt and I'll let you just keep going. Okay, Anna, over to you. Oh, he, Colin has to unmute you. Is Colin still here? Yes, and I'm unmuted. Thank you, Colin. Okay, there you go. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anne, um, for your beautiful introductions to all of us and for bringing us all together. Um, thank you to Tirza and to Joey, who will hopefully join us shortly, um, both who have completely astounding books that are, they're both about, I think, trauma and definitely about healing. And um, not just how to heal, but by reading them, I found personally a sense of healing um, and nourishment. Uh, both intellectually and from the heart. So really, really, really delighted to be here with all of you and these beautiful authors. Um, so Tirza, we started to speak, this is the first time we're meeting, which is yes. amazing. Um, one thing that I was sort of taken with the minute I met you, which is not obviously on my list of questions because we just met, um, this topic seems so heavy, right? We're talking about intergenerational, healing intergenerational trauma which is really it starts all with the trauma before we need to acknowledge it before we get to the healing um but it just seems so heavy and difficult and sad and painful and one of the first things i was taken with when i met you was that you radiate joy 
that's that's a lovely that's a lovely comment. Thank you so much. I I think it is it is hopeful when we learn uh, how we can dissipate the effects of trauma. We have we have all kinds of facility. We have a handle on not passing it down to the next generations. I mean, let's just let me just say as a preface. Anna, that uh, why are we even talking about this? The, the science that has come out in the last 10 years from clinical data, from the laboratories, uh, animal behavior laboratories, as well as human uh, laboratories, the data shows that there are what we, many of us intuited all along that trauma leaves an impact, leaves a residue uh, that can be transferred generation after generation. So we have the data from uh, the Ukrainian uh, uh, famine in the 30s, from the Dutch hunger winter in the 40s. We have all kinds of multi-generational data now that shows that these imprints of things that went on for historical traumas for so many ethnicities does get transferred from generation to generation, can it can get transferred, not in every situation. It doesn't change our genes, but it changes gene expression. And there's Joey. You made it. Hi. Can you can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Well, I just had to uh, come in on my um, cell phone. Wonderful. It worked. We're so happy you're here. Yeah. I'm uh, so glad you said what you just said, because in my family, we have intergenerational trauma, which I am a recipient. My great my grandmother was um, as a young woman, like a very young girl, maybe twelve or fourteen, in a pogrom. And this family story is that she hid in the closet, and could hear her sister being gang raped. Oh God! I don't know if I believe that. Uh, my aunt thinks she probably was actually raped herself. And so then she was so crazy and traumatized that her family sent her to be with cousins in New Jersey. And my grandfather saw her there and they saw, they kind of married her to him. And every time he came home from the synagogue on Friday night and tried to go to bed with his wife, she would scream, he's killing me, he's killing me. And that's what my father heard as a little boy. So when my sisters and I became interested in boys, shall we say, he was hysterical. And um, we all got hooked up and married and divorced. And to this day, we're old ladies and we're all single. Well, let's just dive right in, Joey. I mean, <laughs> so no, I'm no, living through, no way. you are waste a minute. Right. And I, that's why I loved your book so much because I totally identified. And no. I, I uh, you know, read this book as soon as it came out. Anything but yes, this is Joey's book, whose uh, protagonist is Anna, Anna. Um, and another Anna, <laughs> she's such a uh, completely believable figure. I mean, she's a historical figure, but the way you've put together her diary and fleshed it out and breathed life into it, Joey, um, it's a, a must read, especially now, uh, since we're not holding back. I want to say that, um, I think the three of us are Jewish women, uh, and what is going on in the Jewish world right now on the world stage with the hostages, with kept being in captivity. I couldn't not think about that when I read about Anna. And um, it's so, because she is kidnapped and taken hostage by the, by the church in the 1750s, right? 1749, yeah. Yeah. So um, everything feels so, so poignant and relevant right now. And um, Anna, we'll let you say a few words here because you're moderating us. No, I'm appreciating both of you and what you're saying. Um, we were talking a little earlier right before everyone came on, Teresa and I, about um, just singing your praises, Joey, and how this book is about, you know, it takes place in the 1700s, and yet it feels so current. It feels really important to right now for a whole lot of different reasons. Um, and one thing I just wanted to get back, circle back on, is well two things when we're talking about you know how this continues to live in the body and how the diagnoses that we get in these gen in the next generations to come um 
I, I was really interested, and you know, you both touched on this a little of how we continue to carry this. And of course, that's a big part of both your books. Um, one thing that's so interesting I'm finding is, you know, we tend to, a lot of people discuss, right, the feeling of being diagnosed with something and a sense of relief, whether it's medical or mental, something of like, now I know what it is. So now I can get the help I need or get the healing or get the support. But there was a step sort of behind that or under that, that I believe, Tirza, you talk about very directly. And I think, um, Joey, you set the stage for and what was going on generations ago. Um, that under that diagnosis for many of us is actually an intergenerational trauma that we're carrying. And so things that manifest as anxiety, as that seem almost, you know, where did it even come from? It's mysterious. I just have this chemical anxiety or this chemical, you know, what depression or that these things are often actually coming from the past and that they're, they're part of a larger web work, a matrix uh, that is, if you scratch the surface, you'll see, I mean, it may actually be that I have uh, had a trauma in my life. God forbid I was, you know, I had a violation. So, uh, somebody violated my boundaries or I had a terrible car accident or I was born with this or I had a brother who died young or, uh, you know, these things in, in our generation. But when you start to scratch the surface and widen the lens to the family of origin and the ancestry, it's amazing how the there are precursors for the things that we suffer for, uh, suffer from. And looking at it from a larger lens gives us a sense of, in a sense, relief that, oh, this didn't start with me. I have, I'm carrying this. It landed in me. This is the what I have to my givens we say in Hebrew need to name uh, my givens are these but there are ancestors who can help me there's also ancestors uh, who who suffered like I did uh, who that were we're in this together there's a, a larger scope um, what do you think Joey well I was going to say does that help us for example when I see when I understood what my father had been through what his mother had been through that helped me forgive my father for being so unreasonable with me as a teenager. And so that helped me heal, mm -hmm. knowing that helps me heal. That's and right. I think that's part of it. I don't think that there's a Jew in history who doesn't have some intergenerational trauma right. considering our history. That's, um, right. that's right. What happened, what happened in um, Italy uh, in, for hundreds of years is that um, the popes believed, and I like to think that they honestly believed that the Jews were all going to go to hell. In fact, every non-Christian was going to go to hell and, and suffer for eternity. I also think they believed uh, in the case of Rome that it was outrageous that there should be so many Jews flourishing, wealthy, uh, in fact, lending money to the Vatican, uh, who refused to accept Christ. And so they did everything they could to force them to convert to Catholicism, mm -hmm. to save themselves, but also to save face. And this became, of course, it was horrible for the Middle Ages. It was horrible forever. But um, when the Catholics were threatened by the Protestant movement, it became especially horrible. And so in 1555, the Pope at the time, Pope Paul, during the Council of Trent, decided to put all the Jews into a ghetto. And he made them pay for the ghetto walls. He made them sell all of their property at whatever price the Catholics wanted to pay for it and move into this very undesirable, very low part of the city on the water, on the river, um, and rent. And he, was, he assumed that if he made life miserable enough for the Jews, within two generations, they would all convert. So we have reason for trauma there. Going back to 1555, what absolutely astonished me is that although the wolves, the, uh, the, um, the terrible burdens that the Pope put on the Jews and successive Popes put on more and more, the Jews didn't all convert. And eventually they took away the Jews' banking licenses. So there was poverty and that didn't work. So they began to find reasons to abduct 
Jews from the ghetto and try to force them to convert. And that's what happened to my character. So uh, the story I'm, story I'm writing is of this in, inflicted trauma um, that was supposed to break her down so that she would become a Catholic. She would agree to being baptized, which she fought so hard. But of the girls, and they mostly took young girls because they were easier to break down. And also because they would get married, they would marry them off to Catholic men and they would have lots more Catholic babies. Um, very, very few ever came back. But going to your our conversation about trauma, of those who did come back, few lived very long. How long did so, Anna, your character, well, I don't want to give away the ending of the book. <laughs> oh, okay. But uh, it does seem that her life, well, that's hard. I don't want to be a spoiler, but her life was deeply imprinted. Uh, she was a very promising, she had a very promising future. That Yes, she did. Yes, she did. And what happened when they closed the Jews in and very what became incredibly crowded conditions, that instead of turning on each other, which if you know, if you put a bunch of rats into a cage that's too small, they will. The Jews did this. To care of and it, it became their haven because as long as you were in the ghetto, there were no non-Jews around you. So nobody could taunt you, nobody could uh, persecute you. It was all other Jews. It was safe. And they developed their own language, their own dialect, their own, and of course they had their own foods and um, it, it was really interesting what happened. So they didn't want to become Catholic because what happens when you became Catholic is you're never allowed to get within so many feet or yards of the ghetto and you can never see another Jew. That means you can't see your mother, your father, your husband, your children. So that was why they didn't convert because I used to think when I first moved to Italy, well, so why didn't they just convert? It was horrible. <laughs> so now I know. But what I didn't know was why for 300 years, not one Pope let them out. That's astonishing. And I also, I want to give uh, another layer of that, which is that their faith in God was so strong and their sense of identity. Uh, it was, I think, more their sense of identity than anything else. Yeah, it was so um, strong that they didn't, they, it, it didn't, uh, now, it, we, uh, I want to widen the lens a little bit to say that what happened in Rome and happened in Italy from, from all throughout the Middle Ages was also happening in other countries. And, of course. Uh, in Spain and all through, all through Europe, really, uh, and Portugal, uh, the, the religious discrimination was so profound and powerful. And when you think about all of us today, I think what Joey just said is so right on that there isn't a Jew alive, whether you're even identified as a Jew, whether you are whether you even care or think of yourself as Jewish, we're all carriers of history. And That's right. it, affects us. it affects our character. Yeah. So you think about the things that, that we consider stereotypical Ashkenazi Jewish, like whatever bad could happen, we think it's gonna happen. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, I say to my daughter, I don't want you to go driving out now, it's pouring rain. I, I, mean, I don't want you to, I mean, things like that, or, or she'll say to me, uh, you better let me drive, or you better do this. It's because we're afraid. It's um, the anxiety and the fear, but it's not only Ashkenazic Jews, it's also- Oh, I can only speak for my own- Rachi and Sephardic <laughs> Jews as well. Sure, and yeah. yeah, I just want to tap into that. And what we're talking about here about, it's definitely widespread. It's, all, it's Jews all over the world experience this. But I also want to touch on, one thing we're very aware of now, right, that's often in the conversation is intersectionality, is the degree to which you are marginalized compounds to the degree to which you experience trauma, um, whether yeah. that's micro or macro, whether that goes back generationally or that goes, it's going on right now. Um, yes. You know, we both touched on tenderly, because I know this is a tender topic, assault, you know, which happens to all genders, but primarily women and marginalized genders, mm -hmm. um, non-cis men, and especially non-cis het men. So understanding that this happens to everyone, but you know, of people of all genders, but it is something that is 
embedded with misogyny. So I want to talk a little bit about, first of all, how we, in this lifetime, right, we also are experiencing new traumas. Many of us experience traumas all the time. And the way that we experience trauma compounded with history, compounded with what we're carrying. But I also want to touch on with that, and I know these are a lot of layers, but I think we can hold all of them. Sure. Uh, is that we are the three of us Jewish women. And I was thinking a lot about from both of your books, how being a woman is an ancestral trauma that isn't often uh -huh. discussed. We talk about patriarchy. We talk about snatching the patriarchy. We talk about all the traumas one goes through as a woman in this lifetime, but we aren't talking about the compounded generational trauma of being a woman and yeah. then you piece that together with everything else we're talking about and both you know when I look at your character Joey um who is a woman and how important it was that she told her story and that you told her story no we because women didn't have voices exactly. um you know uh, there's a book about Jewish women I think it's called something like the forgotten sex you know women didn't write books and get published women weren't rabbis Women weren't the church elders or the family elders. Their stories stayed with them. So, um, and even in Italy, people don't know what happened to Jews in Rome. Even in Rome, they don't know. They wouldn't believe it Beca uh, because we kind of forget stuff that we don't want to remember. You know, we don't keep telling that story over and over. Uh, you have to go to the synagogue in Rome to find that out. So, yeah, I mean, I thought giving a woman a voice was really important. There were, because so few women came back, there were no records of what happened. So after she wrote down what happened, her family had to hide it because if the Catholic church found out they'd been criticized, especially by a Jewish woman, it would have been terrible for them. So it was hidden for years. It wasn't discovered until like, I think 1985 in a private library in Israel. So yeah, I'm try I think that all of us who are writers who are women, are trying to give a voice to the voiceless. That's their job. And um, even any kind of book you write, you're telling it from a woman's point of view because that's the only point of view you have access to. Right, and so many books that are about women, books, movies that are supposedly feminist, but they're written by men. They're definitely a man's idea of what a woman is thinking or needs or wants, which doesn't necessarily reflect us at all. No, that's, a, that's why it's so important for us to keep keep our voices being heard because we're like the spokespeople for our, our gender. Oh, you're on mute, Tirza. Colin, can we unmute Tirza? Thank you. Um, if you think about this era that we're living in, I, I'm again, taking to your marvelous comment, Anna, uh, this is a this is a golden moment in history when we can look through that big lens at the big systems that have been controlling us for not only hundreds of years, but literally thousands. If you think about the patriarchal system or you think about the misguided system of white supremacy or male dominance or even uh, uh, to some degree capitalism or the 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 uh, the idea which i think is part of patri patriarchy that we can continue to consume and consume and consume and draw from mother earth all of her minerals and all of her resources and her trees that just use her up that too is a, a, a in a sense a myth got misguided mythic system that we've been living under that in our era we can start to look at examine understand perhaps have some compassion for, perhaps have some rage for and outrage for and begin to, to push back uh, uh, on, that, on that kind of thinking, which I think is happening. And that is um, part and parcel of the transformation that we're living through and the chaos that we're living through because so many of us are pushing back against the belief systems, the structures that have been on, you know, who, you know in our grandmother's era, who pushed back against uh, who pushed back against male dominance. It was like, that's what it was. They brought home the the bread and not the bacon in many cases, but uh, <laughs> we, lived, we lived with that. Um, so I think that there is, I, I, you know, we just 
uh, last year celebrated 50 years of the first woman rabbi being ordained that you know to our grandmothers or great grandmothers that would have been just the most unbelievable silly thing that no way will ever a woman be ordained that's just absurd and uh, and it's happening and women are theologians and professors and rabbis and um and ministers that uh, not priests yet except in the uh in in some churches but it is starting to shift and there's there's just this groundswell of of uh transformation which is very very exciting i would just like to say something in response to anna's earlier comment that being a woman being born a woman is in itself traumatic because i i refuse to believe that i think being a woman is my superpower it's my strength and part of that is because i was brought up to believe that because even my father said don't ever let anybody tell you there's anything you can't do because you're a female. And and my mother was a lawyer. She was his law partner. I never heard my father tell my mother, could you get me a cup of coffee? It was just impossible. He wouldn't ask that of his law partner, would he? <laughs> so um, I don't I don't think it has to be. I think we have to own our female power and say, I mean, I know I'm stronger than any man I've ever met in my in my person. Maybe not in my physical body, but in my spirit, I am. Um, I hear you. I, th I just want to clarify because I think it's really important to also to own both of those things. That, and I also think what we're talking about today is the is the wisdom in trauma. And I think I have some writing on that. You both have writing on that that we can get into. Um, the wisdom of being a targeted person. The wisdom of trauma, the wisdom of marginalization, what happens to people who experience that, and the wisdom that comes out of that, right? That we don't wish that on anybody. We don't wish oppression on anyone. We don't wish an attack on anyone. And, and I certainly wouldn't want anyone to feel grateful for that. And there is a wisdom that comes out of that. And to honor that, to honor that we have, right. that whether it's Jews or women or you know, people all over the world right now, and we'll, we'll get into that as well, um, Israel, Palestine, that, that having violence used against you and targeted violence is a trauma. And oh, it is. I mean, there's, you're saying that whether or not you've ever been the, the victim of violence, the threat of violence is with you yes. from so, forever. And, and living within a system that tells you that you're uh, that you're not worth much or that you are a chattel or that you are uh, must submit to male laws and right, rules. I mean, look what's happening the only way you're going to survive now. is if a, a, who's going to take care of her? Who's going to provide for her with the implication that because she's a woman, she could never do that for herself. And, and I, we need to put on the table here this enormous regression that's happening in the world right now. That's happening oh. in Oh. In the United States, uh, I know Joey, you live in the Italy, but the United States, it's it, this is an incredible throwback to the 1950s, oh. Roe v. Wade being being undone, and women scrambling for their health care, scrambling what happens when they get, uh, you know, when they become pregnant and they can't carry that child or don't want to. I mean, so we're uh, yes, it's our superpower, and given the bigger context, yeah. yeah. I just don't want women to buy into the victim mentality. Of course. That's of course. what I'm saying. Both are, true. Both are true. I mean, you know more than I do that in the Jewish religion, abortion is not a bad thing. If the, if the uh, mother's life is threatened, you have to have an abortion, don't you? That's right. It's all yeah. about That's So right. I know there's a lawsuit somewhere that they're, they're suing for religious freedom. That's right. Right? Yeah. That's right. In the US. That brings us to, there was a topic that Monkfish really wanted us to talk about. I'm not sure where it originated, but it's definitely interesting and topical, which is ideology versus religion. And I'd like to actually expand that a bit more because um, for me, I contort a bit when I hear um, in a Jewish space as asked to use English words, such as religion, um, because for me, a large part of my book is reclaiming ancestral wisdom through ancestral language. Oh, and, great. and that so much of what gets twisted out of us 
is the words to explain what's going on or our relationship to that, right? When we're talking about the word religion, I feel like we've already lost the conversation if we're talking about Judaism because it's not our word. That's right. Very good. Yes. Uh, I don't love that word. I, I rarely use it uh, unless I'm talking about religious doctrine. But uh, I think so many of us, and I'm sure the people that are listening to this to, to this conversation are, are all about unfurling uh, our innate spirituality and are interested in that and interested in, in rebirthing ourselves and, that, and finding sacred purpose. And all of that is spirituality. It's not necessarily religion. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I would. I mean, it's easy to reject the idea that that's not my religion or I don't believe in religion, but we all have to embrace some kind of spirituality, whether we think we are or not. Mm -hmm. Because there's so it. much there's so much we don't know. Right. And the idea of the mystery itself being allowed to be part of spirituality, that that you don't have to say, oh, I know. And in fact, Judaism, we have levels, which the more I get into this, the more I get very excited about the levels we have in Judaism, which is not knowing is one of the highest levels. Having absolutely no idea is one of the highest levels of consciousness is realizing I have no idea what's going on. And yeah. That's, I love that. That's the I am, the and, and so. Um, right. That's like, I know enough now to know I don't know anything. Right. That's and that God is beyond name and form. Like we don't, if you, if you think you know God's name, you might have already lost the plot, you know? And right. So, right. so the idea of this, of this, that-ness being beyond name, being and sure that we have healing names and healing words, but that, that we, and that there is this idea of finding the name of God, you know, that's in Jewish mysticism, but that the idea ultimately is that, or the starting point is that God is Hashem, God is the name, God is a name we don't pronounce because it's beyond something we could even understand. So then you're, when we get you're into- a good, You're a good student of Jewish mysticism, Anna. That's wonderful. I would love to hear a piece from your book, which is forthcoming. If you'd like to read one, are you, did you select one to read? Yeah, I would, that's, I would be delighted. So I picked a poem that, um, I had mentioned this to Tirza right before um, we began, that I was reading Wounds Into Wisdom, this beautiful book, and as well as um, Anything But Yes, which both talk about the need to understand you exist first, the need to, you know, you, we talk about Anna saying, using her own name, Hana, which I also do, just like the character in the book. Um, make sure that you'll see my name is in Hebrew as well. Um, and it's Hana Bas Panina, which is my mother's name. And that's also part of the healing tradition in Judaism. And is that you say your name and the, you're the daughter of, or son of your mother's name in healing prayer. Um, so I bring all that up because the poem I'm going to read to you, when I first read it, in a group of you know diverse folks of all different backgrounds, a lot of people thought it was metaphor and what I was experiencing. And then I read Wounds into Wisdom, and I was like, she gets it. <laughs> Not only did she get it, but she's teaching it to all of us on a deeper level. Um, that this is actually an experience. It's not a metaphor. It's it's a real experience. Um, so with that, I will read this book, this poem. Um, I think I saw my beautiful mother is on this call, and she is in this poem. Um, so. I will just say that out, right? But um, with that, I will read this. So this is called, but what if generational trauma is generational wisdom? One, are you going outside to be melancholy? Your mother asks you as a preteen, your fingers wrapped around the doorknob. You know now she's been watching you. It's a funny word, melancholy, and she has fun with it. You smile back, nod, and leave. It's a thing you do, disappear from a group as they share laughter and walk out to the edge of the street or on a day your friends board the bus to the theme park, you decide you want to be home. There is that afternoon in your early teens when you live on your own already and your mother meets you in a cafe. You confess you carry a sadness and you don't know why. She tells you about survival your grandmother in Auschwitz death camp with her sisters, their parents murdered on their first day. She tells you about Lily, your grandmother's little sister who fought a capo for a woman and her children to be spared. She tells you about Lily celebrating her own liberation with her first 
taxi ride from Seagate to Bucharest and being shot dead on the way. She tells you about looking for your grandmother's brother after the war. Now call it what it was, the murders, the genocide, finding out he was captured by Nazis then when liberation came, mistaken for them, captured and imprisoned. She tells you about fleeing great grandmothers who ran from pogroms in Odessa and places in Belarus she couldn't remember and from Siga with a son who became your grandfather. She tells you about the woman who slept tradition on her back and couldn't find it anywhere. In the man who paid for her boat to America, she tells you about women who buried themselves in men, who buried themselves in factory jobs, and who made your mother practice hiding in a New York City apartment for, quote, when they come for us. Yeah. She tells you about Talmud scholars of Romania and great rabbis of Brooklyn and their orphaned children who loved you. She doesn't tell you about herself, maybe you know. For a moment you can breathe. The sadness hovers outside of you, too. You don't know you are making your own sadness worth keeping now, your own fleeing from home, your own terror as you make your way alone, your yichis, your lineage, you don't yet understand, you can make something else, something easier to hold. That your yichas, your lineage includes nights studying by candlelight and dancing with Torah scrolls. Your genealogical records originate from the town of broken and whole, from in exile and here, from midnight rectification on your knees and pray the morning service from this is where you cry. And this is where you bow. Your progeny can be named after say this bracha, this blessing. May this be an action of healing for you heal without charge. You are in the in-between time, still wrestling with grace, not yet given a new name. You don't yet know what you are mother to. For years, you'll forget that conversation as a teen when your mother met you. You'll have found your own man to bury yourself alive in and not yet know you are underground. You will call the pine box making a home. The sadness stirs, sleeping in your arms, waking to suckle, yawning, drifting back into sleep. In slumber, its eyelids flutter. What it imagines, you don't know. You, cra you cradle the sadness its clammy body, listen to its breath against your chest. It looks just like you. You almost believe it came from you. You almost believe it's yours. Mm. Brava. Beautiful. Thank you so much. That is so moving. Thank you. So moving, Anna. Thank you. I love the line where you say you find your own man to bury yourself alive in. I thought that was perfect. You call the pine books making a home. Yeah, thank mm. you. Quite a feminist statement. <laughs> Joey, do you want to read a, a bit from your book? Well, I'm not going to be reading anything that deals with intergenerational trauma because I only deal with one trauma, which is honest trauma. But I would like to read just the beginning of the book where I describe what it's like to be in the ghetto. Um, and we'll try to do that with this right in front of me, this telephone. One bell, one hour after dawn. The light of a Roman April rouses the narrow ghetto streets from balcony railings, worn garments in harlequin shades of red, violet, blue and green, wave like flags in the warm morning breeze. On the Strada de la Rua, a merchant arranges baskets overflowing with used bits and pieces, tableware, kitchen utensils, doorknobs, drawer pulls, hinges. Half hidden in his doorway, a jeweler sits at a table covered in worn black velvet, arranging and rearranging his display of coral and silver. Stray cats chase each other through the rubbish and shadows of the alleys, 
down to the Strada della Fiumara on the banks of the Tiber, where the air reeks of fish and feces. Ancient stone houses slump shoulder to shoulder like drunken old men. Every decrepit room, every stifling attic, every dank cellar home to five or six people. Women carry chairs out onto the street, maneuvering to find a shard of sunlight. Graying heads bend low, nose to fabric, so that ruined eyes can see tiny stitches. Calloused hands mend a linen tablecloth, reline a jacket, add fresh lace to the ragged hem of a skirt. One of the women is nearly bald. Another's neck is gnarled by a goiter. Most of them are missing teeth. A woman wheezes, shoulders rising with the effort of each breath, then coughs violently, lungs clogged with lint and dirt. Even the youngest of the women looks old. They are the daughters of Zion, descendants of Rachel, Esther, and Mirame. On a rotten wooden landing near the Arco di Atzimele, a woman stops beating dust from a rug and leans over the railing to berate the ducks goats, stray dogs, and naughty boys who are causing a commotion in the alley below. At the Piazza delle Tre Canella, a plump grandmother staggers, staggers from the fountain, a full bucket balanced on her head. And in the tiny Piazzetta del Pancotto, the aroma of freshly baked bread breezes about, momentarily cloaking the stench of the public toilets. Near the Piazza della Cinque Scuole, elegant English gentlemen in search of souvenirs use silver-tipped walking sticks to poke through crates of cheap treasures, a mosaic rendering of the Colosseum, a fragment of marble statuary scraped and pounded to appear ancient. Ladies examine etchings of squalid streets made quaint, holding the cards away from their faces with gloved fingers. Just outside the gates of Severus, four guards, young and muscular, joke and laugh, kick the cobblestones with the tips of their boots, adjust the pistols lodged in their belts. While on the other side of the gate, street peddlers wearing the yellow caps that mark them as Jews throng the Piazza Judea, their wares tied up in bundles or piled onto push carts. They wait impatiently, indignantly, not daring to raise their voices. This is an old game the guards are playing, dawdling past the hour when the heavy iron bars should be lifted. The gates opened. Mm. Powerful. Thank you. You bring us into that world so beautifully and we can smell it. I can smell that. <laughs> That well, I always say, I think to write, you have to make a movie in your head and then just write down what you see. Mm. So I have to go into the ghetto and see everything and smell everything so I can describe it to you. That's so beautiful. Well, I was going to read something else, but uh, that was a little bit more geared toward what's happening in our world, the in current events. But I think... Now I'm going to change my mind uh, after oh. the interview, and let me let me just read uh, something from my younger years. Uh, this is in the introduction to Wounds into Wisdom. Um, in my 25th year, I dreamed of a slender Hungarian woman dressed in a fur coat. Beneath her lavish attire, I saw that she was, in fact, a naked skeleton peering at me with both irony and affection. The woman could see that I was young and raw, paralyzed by an unaimed guilt, barely able to buy myself a teapot or a secondhand sweater without being assailed by self-doubt. Darling, she called to me, her thick accent comforting and somehow familiar. Don't be a fool. Don't you think we would be enjoying our beautiful things if we could? Her jaw clacked with bony laughter. Suddenly, the lights went on in the room and the room filled with richly clad Hungarian ladies, skeletons all, enjoying a tea party. It was clear that they were all dead, yet they were also radiant and full of life. Turning toward me, their voices rose in unison. 
Do you think it helps us that you suffer? Live the life we could not live. I woke up. I sat up in bed and wept. Their words had penetrated me, touching the core of my malaise, an outsized case of survivor's guilt I didn't know that I had. Live the life we could not live. These words became a turning point, a mantra, a North Star. I took them with me as I found my footing in the world, followed the call to become a psychotherapist and ultimately to rejoin the religion that I had fled. But it was not until 15 years later that I learned the truth of my dream. I learned that my German grandmother's entire family had come from Austro-Hungary. Almost all had been murdered in Nazi Europe. Their elegant bearing had not helped one whit to escape Hitler's roundups. Their assimilation into high society meant nothing in the end. Stripped of all their beautiful things, they died like paupers in the death camp. Like many post-Holocaust families, my parents did not speak directly of these matters. The heavy legacy of loss remained muted. I'll stop there. I think it is actually very, very positive to what's happened in my own life after I wrote Wounds into Wisdom to realize that the ancestors are really alive and that they're trying to speak to us like that dream. They're trying to push uh, in on our lives to let us know that they don't need our survivor's guilt. They don't want our despair or our dismay. They want us to be full of joy and and full of life and to do as much as we can do to turn the tide of their trauma, which is unfortunately acting itself out again on the world stage. So uh, that's, That was wonderful. And it made me think of the friends that I have who are the children of Holocaust survivors and the guilt that has ruined their lives. Um, I have a friend who said, when my mother was 16, she watched an SS officer shoot her father in the head. So when I was 16, how I could how could I complain that I needed a prom dress? And and here's a talk you talk about that in Wounds into Wisdom, which is the sort of we start to believe we don't have a right to exist, whether we're saying that directly or experience. Why, why did they die and I'm here? That's why right. did they die and I'm here? Why do I I don't have a right to my pain, which knowing you have a right to your pain is the first step of healing. So the moment we start to believe we don't have the right to our pain, and many of us are socialized into that or experience that, or aren't even ever told that we see whether it's a grandparent or a parent who is a survivor or who overcame something really difficult, we just cannot believe that we have a right by comparison to complain, to fetch, right? But, yeah. but the reality is that's how we begin to heal. That's how we begin to treat other people better, you know, knowing that we and have a right to and if you think that the ancestors actually do need us, they need us to turn this tide to to make the changes. Otherwise, we're just continuing their misery again and again through the generations. I'm just wondering right now. Um, I'm looking at Anne McGrath and and wondering if there's any pressing questions from our wonderful audience uh, today. Should we? There, am I unmuted? Yes. There's one. There's one question. Um, what if you're the only one in your family that recognizes the intergenerational trauma? Oh, wow, to you. <laughs> what do you think, yeah? I mean, I think that gives you a special, um, a special responsibility to be taken as a joy that you can, you can do that work of facing the ancestors and honoring them for what they lived through and also looking at their patterns and saying, uh, these should continue because they're resources and they're riches, they're assets that I wanna continue, but these are uh, this depression or this anxiety or this addiction or whatever is uh, in my intergenerational transmission uh, through the generations, I want to stop here. And uh, by being cognizant, we're bringing it into literally a different part of our brain, out of the emotional brain into the cortical brain, which has more power to say, that's where that's really where change begins is through, someone said this before, uh, through understanding when we get insight 
oh, if that didn't begin with me, then we can, we have the power, we have the freedom to, to shift things. And, and what about interacting with members of your family who aren't ready to do that? Um, you know, I, I think that trying to explain that and convert them to your way of thinking is very, very treacherous. <laughs> What's your advice about that? Um, I, I, for me, I, I would agree. Uh, we can't pull people until they're ready. Uh, but I do really, really believe that when we make changes and we start to uh, face these things, that there is a, 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 a resonant field that, that sets up like a gravitational field feel that it will ripple out into our family without right. without pressing without coercion and no not even mentioning it if you change your behavior they'll be forced to change theirs it's it just happens and our kids feel yeah. it, that oh mom is different or she's carrying herself different it might be completely tacit completely unspoken but yeah um, then things, you react differently i yeah. have another question this is for you anna uh this is julian I'm wondering if you have anything that you would like to share about your writing process and what or whether you use for grounding techniques. Beautiful. Well, yeah, sure. I think there's two different, there's a few different ways that I choose to begin to write something or something chooses to write me. Um, and one is something that a lot of writers talk about, um, especially poets, but I think all kinds of writers, which is where you forget entirely, you don't make it a point to write and you take a big break and you take a beautiful walk or I lie in the grass and forget entirely. And then something sort of comes through that wants to be said, you know, and then either I write it down or write on my phone or I race home or I record it. Um, or sometimes, you know, on driving, I'll pull over and, and record something because it's like the moment I'm not focused on trying to do something, then what needs to be said and done will come through more easily. Um, but there's another way that I write that speaks also to what we're discussing today, which is um, a lot of what I write that people have, I always try to want, I really want people to understand this because when we say, you know, the book is Speakers of Wilderness, Poems on the Sacred Path from Broke into Whole, which is really elongated, remembering we're whole um, the whole time, <laughs> we were never broken, um, is that a lot of times I'll write something and because of these words sacred or spiritual, or because what I'm writing and reading sounds like somehow somebody mistakenly thinks I have it figured out, they think that I'm teaching them. And often what I'm actually doing is writing my fears, like writing a love letter to my fears, writing a love letter to my worries, writing a love letter to me in this body that can't seem to get out of bed for two days. Um, and I, I write myself out of those situations in a lot of ways and back into my body back into my heart back into my wisdom um because there's something wiser than the brain than the you know the mind that thinks it's a mess there's something wiser that that wants to love you <laughs> that's in all of us and when i let that speak and i write from there that's where a lot of my poems come from um and so a lot of the blessings and prayers and poems are writing from that piece inside me you know, that spark of the sacred that loves me no matter what and forgives me no matter what and forgives you no matter what and alleviates a lot of my own suffering um, by writing myself what are basically love letters that become poems. So beautiful. I can't wait to put my hands on that book. Yeah. Yep, I'm going to send you one, Tirza. I should have sent you one. I, I oh, meant to. Oh, that's, I will be your biggest you PR. Really. <laughs> mm, so good. Any other question from the from our audience? I'd love to hear. These are wonderful. I do not see any more questions. Well, there's a lot of comments. So before you leave, you should read the comments because there's many of those, but I don't see any more questions. So we're, we have about four minutes left. So if there's anything else in closing that you would like to say. Mm. Mm. I, I guess I, I would love to bring this into the current moment, which is so tragic and, and, um, and feels, and feels weighty. Um, 
yeah, I do believe we, we, we can change our, that we're not doomed to live these cycles of violence again and again and again. I just want to say that I have great hope that we can. I, turn I hope you're right. I mean, I just imagine that two men in a cave started fighting and never stopped. Yeah, we have some brilliant peacemakers, um, Lily, Lillian Weisberger and Roberta Wall on this call I'm seeing. So um, as well as the women we're speaking with today directly. So just want to call out, we have Women Wages Peace on this call. We have mm -hmm. some really beautiful, brilliant women um, who are doing fierce, fierce and tender work um, to bring peace and stop the cycles of violence and stop thinking that we somehow need to take out our pain on other people. Thank so. you for saying that. And it, it harks back to our, uh, you know, our discussion about these big, these large systems of dominance and, and patriarchy. And, and um, we all need to lean into that. The, that is the, it's the end for these big cycles. It is really- I think so, yeah. It, women, it, women peacemakers take over. The resistance to change is so strong and we're in a period of great change and upheaval. And, and I think that that resistance is what we're experiencing is violence. But um, I just want to say how much I have been honored to be with these women today and to have this conversation. And how I just want to hug you both with all my might. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, it, it's just been a great pleasure and, and very enlightening for me. And thank you to Anne McGrath and to Paul Cohen, who's on the call and everyone. At, yes. And Colin, and Colin, who put this together, tech, uh, his, the tech maven, um, really appreciate it. I hope, I hope uh, all, everyone in the audience feels our love. Well, I, I'll read one of the comments um, on that note. This has been healing and given me a finer perspective. Thank you, beautiful women, which I think is a very nice note to end on. I cannot thank you all enough. That was amazing. And there's so many things to keep thinking about. And there were so many um, new perspectives that I took away from this. So I'm really, really very grateful. Mm. Thank you all so much. Thanks for setting it up. It's it's been a joy. Thank you all. And you should read some of the comments because they're beautiful. They're they're maybe we can save them. I don't know how anything works. Colin, Colin will yeah, tell us that. Does. And then and then just so the um, uh, uh, audience knows, you can uh, look in the chat and see the email address. The uh, not the email addresses. The uh, website links and other things that are going on for the authors and uh uh you can also sign up uh for the monkfish newsletter by going to our website which the link is in the also in the chat so thank you all so much i'm sorry everyone was muted it's really the only way to do it though to get through in an hour i know a few people said they wished it were longer um thank you so much we'll do it again <laughs> yes bye for now bye